ado, it is my pleasure to welcome our guest speaker for this week, which is Dr. Tim Up from SUNY Plattsburgh across the lake. Um, he is professor of environmental science there at Plattsburgh, and he's also the director of the Lake Champlain Research Consortium. So he's here to talk to us about his research um, in the lake, so directly impacting us as well. So welcome, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Emily. It's nice to be here. Um, hello, everyone. How are you doing? Good day today. Nice fall weather. Um, before I start, Emily had asked me to uh, just briefly give a little background on sort of how I got where I am. So I have an undergraduate degree in, in biology. I was in largely a pre-med program for the most part until I was a junior senior and discovered that there were other things in biology besides going to med school. Um, and became more interested in ecology, in particular aquatic ecology. And so that led me for some opportunities to go to grad school. I have a master's degree from Oklahoma State University. And while there, I worked on a study with the University of Colorado in an alpine wetland. So that was fun. I got to climb to 12,000 feet, uh, even scale a break wall at one point for our research. I loved rock climbing and mountain climbing. I still do. Um, and I got a good master's degree out of that working in alpine systems. From there, I went to Idaho, to Idaho State University, and I worked on the Yellowstone National Park wildfires from way back in, in 1988 when Yellowstone, 45% of Yellowstone burned in a wildfire. And my PhD was studying wildfire impacts on stream systems. Then I went um, from there to Louisiana State University for a postdoc and worked on the Mississippi River for a few years and continued that uh, with the Illinois Natural History Survey, working on the upper Mississippi River for several years on another postdoc uh, before I came to Plattsburgh in 1999. And I've been here a while um, as the director of the Lake Champlain Research Institute. And a lot of what I do is aquatic. I'm interested in rivers, lakes, streams, wetlands, really mostly interested in community dynamics and a lot with invertebrate communities. I've done work with fish communities as well uh, but have a lot of interest in how communities work and are structured, and particularly how disturbances might impact those communities. Um, you know, from things like wildfire, or it was hurricanes uh, down south in Louisiana when I was there. Um, I'm interested in disturbance uh, quite a bit. I like to say I'm a disturbance ecologist, not a disturbed ecologist. Um, so let me just go back quick and give some credit to all the people at the Lake Champlain Research Institute, students and staff, graduate students and undergrads uh, who've contributed to the work I'm going to talk about today. Um, we have a, a veritable army of, of researchers and student scientists that, that work for us in the Institute on this, which is one of our largest projects that we conduct, uh, which is doing the long-term monitoring for Lake Champlain particularly for plankton communities in Lake Champlain. And that's largely what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, so most of you know, Lake Champlain is a, is a rather large lake often considered or called the sixth great lake, uh, was in legislation at one point years ago a, as a great lake um, for the purposes of getting federal funding. And it's 120 miles long, an average depth of 124 meters. Um, I'm sorry, 124 meters at its deepest point, which is over 400 feet. Um, mean depth of 22 meters. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a fairly large lake. It's got specific lake sections, as you might know, the Missisquoi Bay section, the, the island section, um, the main lake section, which is really from Plattsburgh to Burlington and a little south of what we call the main lake. Um, generally, the lake is what we call oligotrophic or nutrient, sort of moderate nutrient levels although we have regions of the lake with higher nutrients than others. And these little dots on the map show the monitoring sites that are on the lake that, that are used by both states, Vermont and New York, to sample water quality and, and biota. Um, lake Champlain has undergone a number of changes uh, over time. Uh, the lake connectivity has been altered quite a bit through the building of roads and causeways, especially in the Northeast Arm, where roads and causeways basically in many ways hydrologically isolate the northeast arm uh, from the rest of the lake. Um, and we've had some development in other areas of the lake, but by and large, most of the main lake system is actually a very natural ecosystem. Um, so most of what I'm going to 
talk with you folks today about is zooplankton, zooplankton communities. They're, they're this middle of the food web crustacean group, um, small. You can see them with the naked eye if you take a water sample. And they're largely the food source in the food web for the fish and the other top predators. So um, we don't get to have our top predators in a food web if there's not an energy base below them to support them. And it starts with algae and moves up through the plankton as animal food. And then that, those animals are fed on by fish and other animals. Um, and that supports the top end fishery, the lake trout, the salmon, the things people want to go and catch um, as a game fish. So they're very important in what we call secondary production in the system, which is essentially the first layer of production above the plants in an ecosystem. Um, they're a very important food source, as I said, for forage fish and young and small fish. And they're really key players in the food web in terms of how energy moves through a food web. Now I'll get into the three main groups. There's Clodocera, copepods, and rotifers are our three main big groups of, of plankton. And you'll see some results for each of those. Um, here's some a, a little overview of Cladocera. They're called the water fleas. A few pictures of some of Lake Champlain specimens here. Uh, they're generally herbivorous, feeding on algae and phytoplankton, fairly slow swimmers. Um, they do something called parthenogenesis, which is interesting. Parthenogenesis is called virgin birth. They can, females can produce a generation with no fertilization from a male. So they produce essentially clones of themselves largely in the summer when resources are high and they need to put off another generation quickly. Uh, female cladocerans can do that. They produce basically clones through parthenogenesis. So an interesting genetic or reproductive um, life history trait here found in this group. Um, copepods, copepods are the larger of, of the plankton. They're the better swimmers. Many of them eat the young cladocerans as food, as prey items. So they're better swimmers. They have better, uh, better uh, capabilities to see their prey. Um, they also don't have that ability to do that uh, parthenogenetic reproduction. They can only reproduce once a year uh, when they reproduce uh, at the end of the season. And the rotifers, a very interesting little group. This is a phylum actually, phylum rotifera, uh, the wheel animals. They have the crown of cilia around the top of their, of their, uh, their feeding apparatus. And they get their own phylum because of that. So they're, they're fascinating little creatures. They dominate Lake Champlain's plankton. They're definitely the smallest, um, the least capable of swimming, mostly drifting. Um, and, and probably as you'll see, hopefully here in a few minutes, among the most important groups of, of plankton in the lake. And they've, they've had some very serious impacts uh, in the lake, particularly from zebra mussel uh, invasion. And the last two I'm gonna talk about are, are Part of the focus of this talk, uh, two that have come in recent years that are invasive species from outside of Lake Champlain. They're both from Europe. They're called the spiny water flea and the fish hook water flea. Uh, I'll talk quite a bit about these later, but they're, they're bigger, they're larger plankton. They're both known for these really big long tails that they have that are anti-predator mechanisms. So fish have more trouble feeding on them. Um, and that's a problem. If, if you come into an ecosystem and you have that, you're going to do very well if fish can't feed on you. Um, it's also a problem in that they're non-native. Uh, these two species, I'll be talking about their impacts quite a bit for the next few minutes here um, on Lake Champlain. One invaded in 2014 and the fish hook invaded in 2018. Both were discovered in our lab on samples that we took from Lake Champlain. So I'm just going to briefly get into some overall big picture uh, aspects of Lake Champlain's uh, ecosystem, particularly its food web and how things are connected. And then I'll get back to talking about the plankton story and, and, and how that may have impacts on the food web. Um, as I mentioned, the, the, the planktonic food web is really the big support engine in terms of energetics for the, for the upper part of the fishery. Um, the yellow perch, Atlantic salmon, rainbow smelt, uh, et cetera. And these three depicted here are three new invaders that have come into the system in the last 20 years. So alewife, uh, zebra mussel, and in this case, um, the spiny water flea. And I'm gonna start with zebra mussel um, when I look at, at the impacts, but here's a timeline of the four main invaders um, in the early 90s, 94, around 94, 95, the zebra mussel became widespread throughout Lake Champlain and invaded Lake Champlain. Many of you who, been on Lake Champlain or 
lived on Lake Champlain or know someone with a camp has probably heard about zebra mussels and how they dominate the shoreline of the lake. Uh, we had another invader in the mid 2000s, 2006, seven, eight, uh, the alewife, a fish. We don't know how it got here, but it's a common bait fish on the East Coast. And it, it's likely it came here on a bait bucket introduction. Someone might have brought it on purpose or brought it on accident uh, as bait. And then the other two, spiny water flea and fish hook, um, one invaded in 2014 and another one in 2018. And so I'll talk quite a bit about those two plankton uh, that have entered the lake and what their impacts and effects uh, have been. Much of this work I'm gonna talk about comes from something called the Long-Term uh, Monitoring Program. It's funded by the EPA through the Lake Champlain Basin Program. Um, and it's both states, New York and Vermont, working together to monitor the lake's ecosystem. And you hear a lot about this when you hear about phosphorus on Lake Champlain. All of those sites I showed you on the map and all of those river sites I showed you are where the data comes from that tells us how much phosphorus is moving into Lake Champlain. Uh, so we sample the water quality um, extensively, uh, but I'll, well, I'll talk a lot today about the sampling of the biota that happens at the same time those water quality samples are taken. And this shows some of that, some of the nets we use, uh, vertical net toes for uh, everything from algae to zooplankton to, to mycids. And I'm going to focus on only a few sites in Lake Champlain, and primarily the three deep sites um, in the middle of this table. Uh, it'll be a big focus of this talk. So the pelagic planktonic part of Lake Champlain is where I'll talk a lot about invasive species impacts uh, and other things. So out of those 14 sites, we have a data set of for biota that goes all the way back to the beginning of the program, only though at these five sites. So they're really the focus of the biological work. So the first one I want to talk about is mycids, mycid shrimp. Uh, they're among the largest of the planktonic community. They're visual. You can see them with the naked eye. They're a couple, one or two inches long uh, when, they're, when they're full adults. And it's, so they're very important in the food web. This is every uh, young lake trout or young salmon or young perch is looking to feed on Mysis diluviana um, in the lake. So they had a huge decline in the lake in the 90s, which we finally uh, figured out when we started looking at the long-term data set. Um, and this, this was kind of an important thing. This is after we had published a lot of work on the decline in some of the other plankton associated with the zebra mussel invasion in the early 90s. Um, a few years later, we were working with this data and realized, wow, we have a mycid decline um, that also coincides with that. And we have several papers out published with very, a variety of colleagues and scientists, including some at UVM, on this decline and, and how it happened. So that's the first big point is uh, one of our major components of the food web had a massive decline in the early 90s. And I'm going to get a little into this because I've had a, a graduate student who recently finished some work on, on mycid lake history and population biology. And so this is a little complicated, but it shows on the left, juveniles in the green bars, and on the right, males and females in two different colors, and their size class distribution in each year across the entire data set. So starting in 1992, also including data we have from 1975 mycids that are in a collection at the University of Vermont. Um, and so what you see here is there's a little bit of a change in size class in the 90s where the zebra mussel card is. Um, we had a big shift from larger mussels to smaller, uh, larger mysis to smaller mysis when the zebra mussel entered the lake. There was a pretty big shift in the population uh, and the size distribution of, of this, this major player in the Lake Champlain food web. And the next shift we really observe is a, a shift in size here in 2010, 11, and 12, and that's following the alewife invasion in the lake. And alewife is a major forager on these on mycids and other larger planktonic species. Uh, so we might expect to see some alewife impact on populations of mycids. And I'm going to hone in on the last few years where I can talk about the last two planktonic invaders. Um, in 2014, we saw some changes in mycid sizes associated with the spiny water flea invasion and haven't really seen much change with the, the next invader, the fish hook water flea which is a smaller organism and maybe not as directly uh, competing with mycids, 
uh, spiny water flea is a direct competitor with mycids for food. So they're gonna compete with one another for niche space uh, in the lake system. So this shows again in red is that mycid graph over time, 1992. This one goes out to 2015 uh, for their abundance. But it also shows another organism, the black line, which is the crash in total rotifer populations in the lake that preceded the mysis by basically one or two years. And this was uh, the subject of one of my first students work at Plattsburgh who titled her thesis work, uh, Where Have All the Rotifers Gone? Uh, we've gone from millions and millions and millions of rotifers. Uh, this is number per cubic meter, so 30,000 per cubic meter um, in the lake system to much lower population numbers of this rotifer community. And that directly coincided with the invasion of the zebra mussel into Lake Champlain. And zebra mussels are known to filter directly rotifers out of the water column. They filter them just like they're a particle. Uh, so we really lost a lot of rotifers. And here's a, the dynamics of what species we lost. Um, we used to have all this array of different species, uh, polyarthur, caratella, calicotia, all the common rotifers in freshwater systems. And they're basically mostly gone. And then this one rotifer out here on the end, kind of chelis, um, is the one that's taken over the rotifer community. So if we look at the pictures of these, they're one, they're fascinating. They're really interesting to look at under a scope for sure. But the winner of the zebra mussel invasion was this kind of chelis rotifer. And there's a specific reason they probably are, are more prevalent now. And that is because they're gelatinous colonial rotifer. They stick together in kind of a gelatinous matrix and they get rejected by mussels when, they're, when mussels try to filter them. The mussel can't handle them and will spit them out and reject them from the siphon. Uh, so they don't get filtered directly by the mussels, whereas all the other rotifers are more individual. They're like little particles floating around and they're directly just filtered away uh, by, by mussels. And, and so they had, there was a huge impact of, of zebra mussels filtering water uh, on those other species. So i summarize where we are early in the 90s in Lake Champlain. We have a rotifer decline that's well documented. We have a mycid population decline, more or less at the other end of the planktonic food web uh, that's well documented. And we, we wanna look to see, hey, maybe there's food web connections there. How, we don't really know how the rotifer connection to mycids uh, played out or worked. And I'll talk a little uh, here in a minute about some modeling we did to try to get to that, answer that question. Um, the next invasion I do want to bring up is the alewife invasion. So we waited more than 15 years from zebra mussels invasion to have our next major invasive species in, the, in, the, in Lake Champlain. Um, and that was the alewife fish, which, as I said, we don't know how it got in the lake, but here's its number in green, its population estimate. Um, it shows by 2010, alewife had a pretty significant population in Lake Champlain was relatively low for any year prior to 2009 and was in the lake system as early as 2006 or seven. Um, but really it's become a, a dominant forage fish uh, in the lake. So what are the impacts of that? Now we know mycids are already declined and we know rotifers have already declined. Um, alewife's impact, and here's a little just summary of the biology of alewife that compete directly with native smelt, which is our native forage fish in Lake Champlain. They're herrings, they're members of the herrings. Um, they'll prey on other species eggs, other young native fish, and they'll prey heavily on plankton. Uh, they kind of run around with their mouth open and they have gill rakers and they just filter out plankton uh, as they move around. They're not terribly selective about what they get. They're just looking for large plankton uh, to feed on. And so this graph now brings in Again, you have the mycids in red and the rotifers in black there with their big crash, but you have the other groups of plankton now, uh, Clodocera and copepods, and there's a bit of a spike in both of those after the alewife becomes abundant. And that turns out to be uh, probably a big response of the plankton to alewife invasion. And this is all the smaller bodied um, other plankton in the lake did very well because alewife is taking out a lot of the bigger plankton species and these small species then thrive. They have open niche space and available food. Uh, so they do pretty well uh, after alewife come in. So that's these two groups, the copepods, a variety of different species shown here. 
This is from our T that we have in our lab, a T to the zooplankton of Lake Champlain. Um, one thing interesting about copepods is they have cyclops very commonly in their genus name. And many of them are cyclopsian looking. If you put a little eye on there, you kind of see a cyclops or you may vision a cyclops. So when the scientists name these, uh, cyclops ends up in a lot of the genus names uh, for this group. And there is uh, plankton from SpongeBob up in the corner in his little box. And plankton is a marine copepod. Taxonomically, that's what he is at least. Um, Clodocerans, the water fleas, again, that group, the smaller versions of these, Eubosmina, Bosmina, and some others really uh, did well after alewives came in and had an impact on the larger bodied organisms in, in that group. So we have zebra mussel invasion in the 90s with a, a decline in rotifers and mycids. We have alewife invasion in 2007 with an increase or, or in small plankton species, but an impact on some of the larger bodied plankton. So let's go now to where we are sort of in Lake Champlain at that point prior to 2014. If we look at the food web, and this is in green, all the different types of algae and phytoplankton you might see in the lake, uh, grouped by their type, green algae, diatom, protozoans. Um, and then the little orange boxes are the three big groups of plankton, copepods, clodocera, and rotifers. And when zebra mussel comes in at this end of the food web, it impacts rotifers. And when alewife comes in at the other end of the food web, it impacts these other groups. So we, we're squeezing the food web from two different sides. And in the middle, the, this leptodora, which is a big, a big predator in the lake uh, as well, and mice and shrimp are the ones who are in the middle, sort of responding one way or the other, depending on how they're fit in with the, with the new invader that's come in. So that's two invaders having an effect on really two different parts of, of the main Lake Champlain pelagic food web. So one question we had with that data up through 2015 uh, was, is it possible to try to model this and determine some of the patterns and relationships? So I am going to go into a little bit of a modeling effort that we took out that's published in a book chapter. Um, but I'll go, I'll go through it fairly quickly, and I won't bore you with lots and lots of details of, of modeling. Uh, but we basically have all this data. We have all these species. We have all this data. We even have the water quality data. And I have a colleague who at a meeting, I was at an international meeting, and he, he's actually from uh, Australia. And he came up to me and he said, you know, I gave a talk about long-term patterns in Lake Champlain. And he said, well, we can model your data. We should talk. So we began talking, and eventually I shared all the data with him. And he ran uh, on a supercomputer something called a hybrid evolutionary algorithm model, which is basically a model that keeps iterating itself over and over and over again and uses what we call bootstrap techniques to eventually come to a solution. It takes a lot of computing power to do that. I think the runs were 24 hours or plus on, on the model efforts on a, on a fairly intensive computer system. And in the end, I don't claim to be an expert on these models, but my colleague certainly is, uh, Frederick Recknagel. We came out with a model of what Lake Champlain's data looks like and what may be correlated or related in the food web and some of the patterns. So I'm gonna give you a very short overview of that. Um, this is one of the model outputs that's in our paper. And there's a tiny little food web up here with the players, the interacting players in the food web. And then the main characters of this part of the model is rotifers. We knew rotifers crash, so we knew they'd probably show up in the model as, as important. And you might not be surprised to know that rotifers and mycids have a correlation with one another. Both of them declined in the 90s at, at roughly the same time. Um, they also had a correlation with zebra mussels, which was highly negative. Um, when zebra mussels got to above 395 per square meter density, uh, rotifers declined the most uh, in the lake system. So we now at least have a zebra mussel density that's really, really bad for rotifers. Uh, the other two groups, the, those copepod groups, um, not many impacts here between rotifers and those groups, which we don't see in our data uh, to begin with. So one more model output really quick, which is chlorophyll A, the, the biomass of algae in the system, and a relationship um, particularly with uh, one group, the Daphnid podocerans, which increase as chlorophyll A declines, 
and then no effect on a few other groups, but a correlation of chlorophyll A and rotifers, which probably is directly related to that filtration effect of zebra mussels uh, on particles uh, in the lake. So we got some results that really told us, um, you know, there are some connections here in Lake Champlain's food web in terms of the big picture patterns in the food web uh, in the long-term data set. And one thing you probably may have noticed that I'm not really mentioning is water quality. All of that water quality data, all the nitrogen, phosphorus, there's a lot of it for Lake Champlain. Um, that's in all these models, that's in all our analysis. We don't have any patterns in water quality, nitrogen, phosphorus, or anything that relate to any of these plankton variables in the lake. The plankton seem to be responding much more to the new invasive species than water quality. And that makes sense. This is um, Eric Smeltzer, who's the Vermont State Limnologist at the time, his paper on the trends and patterns from Lake Champlain's data. And so this is all the lake sites um, here. And you look at these trends and patterns, they're very fuzzy and many of them are very flat. So you look at nitrogen, this is chlorophyll A in the middle and nitrogen out here and phosphorus on the left. They're basically flat trends over since 1990 to present. And Lake Champlain has improved in water quality. You can see that in some of the graphs where we've reduced nitrogen, we've, re we've reduced phosphorus. The one system up in Missisquoi Bay is a system where we've seen phosphorus increases, which is, has a lot to do with blue-green algae blooms in that system. But generally speaking, water quality in the main lake is fairly flat over the last 30 years. And I know we see a lot on the news about that, but the data basically says our water quality in the lake is roughly similar to what it's been uh, for the last several decades. No real big giant changes, maybe some trends moving down. And that might, we would need big changes in water quality to drive big changes in the planktonic food web. And we don't see that uh, in Lake Champlain over the last 30 years. Um, I used to end this talk and just wrap it up with, you know, how alewife and how zebra mussels have impacted the food web. And I had a little section on future invaders we would like to avoid in Lake Champlain. Well, in 2014, all of that changed. We, our future invaders became present invaders. Um, we had the spiny water flea invade the lake, most likely on boat traffic from Lake George, where they had in, had been known for several years, um, or, or um, other lakes in New York, Sacandaga Lake, where they were first introduced to the Adirondacks in 2008. Um, anyways, we found them in Lake Champlain. They were part of the sampling regime for the long-term monitoring. And in 2018, completely unexpectedly, because they weren't as close as the spiny water flea was to us, they were in Lake Ontario. Uh, we had the fishhook water flea invade Lake Champlain. So now my talk is, oh my God, we've had two new invaders. What have they done to the lake? And this shows you just bit the trephies density, um, basically nothing until 2014 when they basically exploded. Uh, in Lake Champlain in abundance. And I'm going to briefly describe that for you. Um, this is a bit the trephies with four brood on its back, um, literally one taken within a couple of weeks of the first discovery of this in Lake Champlain. And so we're seeing them, we're seeing them reproducing rapidly. Um, in my infinite wisdom, having worked on plankton in the lake for years, when I found the first specimen in a sample, someone showed it to me, I said, oh, it'll probably take a couple of years before that really expands and takes over the lake. Um, I was absolutely wrong. It took less than two weeks and here we go. So what you see here is Lake Champlain with these red circles and that's the sampling of all of those monitoring sites. And when you see nothing, it means there's no bifitrephes in any sample. So this is early August of 2014. These samples are basically taken every two weeks. In late August, we'd already discovered it at one or two other, other sites. We had like one or two specimens. We start to see it in the South Lake in some reasonable densities. And we're like, oh boy. Well, within two weeks later, we have detected it at every monitoring site on the main lake. And some of these circles are really high densities for this species. 10 or 20 per cubic meter is a lot of bifitrephes because it's a really big organism. And then we went out past September for the rest of the season and it's just taken over the lake. So I wasn't kidding when I said literally in two to four weeks, this invasion occurred and got to dramatically high densities. 
in Lake Champlain. And this is my best example of that. A picture is worth a thousand data points. Um, Gabriella Dowd, came, one of the students in our institute, sent me this picture by email to my office and said, do I have to count this? This was a sample taken literally about two to three weeks after we discovered Vista Trekkies in Lake Champlain. This is in the South Burlington waterfront, Station 21 on Lake Champlain. There's about 500 Vista Trekkies in this sample. Um, it's an inordinately high density for this species. Um, so yes, my answer to her was, yes, you have to count them. It's extremely important. All of this data that we're gonna get is extremely important for changes that will occur in the lake. Um, and we did have changes. So this arrow here shows you the 2015 densities of the rest of the plankton species. And they basically all crashed when Bithotrephes came in. This top predator came in, it either ate them directly or it displaced them in other ways ecologically. Um, and again, it has this long spine, so predators have trouble feeding on it. So it's got a lot of open niche space to come in and essentially wreak havoc. It's like the bully in the lunchroom in middle school. They get to sit where they want, they get the whole table if they want it because they're the bully. That's what the Trephes is in Lake Champlain. Um, here's another example of, it, of the impact. So this shows you the distribution vertically of one species. It's called Bathnia retrocurva. And here we had data from 2013 before they invaded. And you can see during the day and at night, they basically are all sitting in the top surface of the water column. This is from zero to 50 meters and their density bar goes out from left to right. Well, we had this invasion, so we repeated this sampling thinking, oh, it may impact the vertical migration of some of these species. And sure enough, during the day, spiny water flea love to sit at the top of the water column in the surface waters. They were eating all the Daphnia and forcing the rest to migrate down um, when, after we had the, the spiny water flea invasion. And Daphnia retrocurva is one of our most abundant plankton species in the lake. Uh, so they had a big impact early on, not only on behavior, but on other aspects uh, of the rest of the plankton in the lake system. Um, well, it didn't end there. I thought maybe my invasion career of plankton in Lake Champlain would, would end with, with spiny water flea. Um, it didn't. In 2018, another sample in the lab, someone basically called me in and said, I don't think this is a spiny water flea. I think it's something else. And there's a picture of it. And I looked at it and I said, oh my God, that's a fish hook water flea. So it's different species. Not the, you know, not the same, and, this, and we had, a, I won't get into the maps or anything, but the invasion of this species was very similar to spiny water flea. One, it jumped several hundred miles from Lake Ontario and the Finger Lakes to Lake Champlain in one invasion step. We didn't record it anywhere else in, on the way in the Adirondacks or anywhere else. So this is almost very likely, in my opinion, a boat introduction on someone's boat that wasn't cleaned and was fishing in probably Lake Ontario and then they left their boat wet, they left some eggs or some live uh, fish hook on it, and then they went to Lake Champlain and decided to fish again, and, and, so, and fish hook water flea gets in the lake. Uh, so boat transport's a big issue. Um, this thing expanded just like the other one within weeks, took over. It's actually still here in really high densities, even in 2021. Um, it's, it's doing very well in Lake Champlain and, and seems to love it here. I'm going to go through a couple of quick just what impacts of that from one of my grad students, Zach Cutter's uh, work, and I'll just go through these fairly quickly. But this panel in the upper right is the seasonal dynamics of the abundance of, in this case, um, cyclopoid copepods before invasion. So it shows a peak in summer and it shows uh, a variety of different species in different colors here. And then what you see after invasion, so this is after Bithotrephes. And then the bottom one is after fish hook or cercopagus invasion. What it's doing is pushing their life history early in the season. The only time some of these species like Diacyclops tomasi here can be prevalent in high abundance in the lake is when Bithotrephes is not in the lake or when fish hook is not. Bithotrephes and fish hook do not come off their winter resting stages until even early to mid to late August. So you have the early months of the season when these plankton can do well, but as soon as those new invaders come on as adults, uh, they consume them or they displace them and their abundances go down quite dramatically. Um, here's another one, this is Daphnids. 
um, the, the water fleas, uh, showing again a change in their seasonal pattern. In this case, it wasn't a movement or a suppression to early in the season. Um, it was a broadening of, of, of their density in the case of with the, the spiny water flea, but the trephes invasion. And then it was this huge decline, particularly in one uh, species called Seriodaphnia um, with the fish hook invasion. Seriodaphnia must be heavily susceptible to predation by fish hook water flea. And one last one, this is that rotifer I mentioned, the colonial rotifer that's doing so well in Lake Champlain uh, was impacted by these invasions as well, mostly by the last one, the one on the bottom here, uh, the fish hook water flea invasion um, had a serious impact from on conichelous rotifers. So, uh, and all the other rotifers are still in really low abundances in the lake. Uh, this one's now, now having some trouble uh, maintaining abundances that it had pre-invasion. So one last big graph, this is one of my favorite ones. It's the brand new graph hot out of our research lab that I just got literally in the last week. So this is from my student, Zach, who's working on a paper from his master's thesis. And it shows Diacyclops tomasi, one of the really common plankton species in Lake Champlain. And each of these bubbles is density. So the size of the bubble gets bigger means there's more density there. And the left panel is in deep sites and the right panel is in shallow sites. And then each of the two panels goes, this is pre-spiny water flea. And then these middle two, where it says SWF with the arrow is post-spiny water flea. And all you need to do is look at kind of the bubblegum plot and see the distribution of abundance across um, you know, uh, the space here. And, and this is by season. So the colors of the seasons are labeled out here. These light blues are the late season, October, September, are the lighter greens and blues. And what you see here is where the arrow is for SWF, the densities go way down uh, in the late season. And that's because that's really abundant late. Spiny water flea is really abundant in the late season. So they're directly impacting the densities of this particular prey species. And you see then the same thing on the bottom four plots. If you look at the bottom right plot, left plot, sorry, you see these low densities late in the season with the fishhook water flea invasion. And so the two above it are the references for when there's, there's no fish hook in the lake, or the top two is the reference for when there's no, no spiny water flea in the lake. So this is our newest community analysis. It really, it's incorporating thousands of data points here. So it's, it's, it's a sort of our, our way we're trying to approach it. We're using here something called a community ordination technique. Um, for those interested or wanna know more, it's called non-metric multidimensional scaling. It's just a way to look at really big data sets and extract the variation and look at the patterns that might be occurring across a large set of samples. And that's what this is, a large set of samples. And it shows basically for this one species, um, a big impact of both invaders uh, on, their, on their, basically on their direct density in the lake system, on their population dynamics. Um, so those two invasions have had a, a, a pretty big effect on the planktonic a food web in Lake Champlain. So what I'm gonna do is conclude with kind of a big picture summary of where Lake Champlain is in terms of the main part of its food web uh, and over the last say 25 plus years after four major invasions of other of non-native species. So if we look at the food web, we had the zebra mussel come in, had the direct impact on rotifers, and then that resulted in a mycid decline, which, which is, was a food web impact. We had the alewife come in, again, directly affecting the food web, but from the other side, from the top end of the food web. The spiny water flea in 2014 came in, again, from more the top end of the food web and had an impact. And then the fishhook water flea came in and had a little bit more of an impact on some of the smaller species uh, than spiny water flea did. So if you're thinking of this as taking hits from multiple sides, um, you took a hit on this side really big time from zebra mussels. And then you took three hits more at the top of the food web in terms of disruption uh, of native species and, and displacement of them and declines in abundance in, in many of them. Particularly mysis, that shrimp has really lost um, its foothold in terms of niche space in Lake Champlain. Mysis is probably the most important fish food item for smelt and alewife and, and 
and young trout and young salmon. Uh, so there's big implications there uh, for, our, for our fishery in the lake. Um, and, and basically, my story really is one of invasive species and their impacts, um, invasive species and, and some really big negative impacts on the lake. Um, and I, I've become a very big proponent in, in the last few decades of uh, control on transport of invasive species. I really think we need to do something about it. We need to stop these things from moving around because guess who's moving these species around? It's us, it's society, it's boats. Um, none of these came on their own. They were moved by humans. Zebra mussels came in a ship to the Great Lakes. Alewife come in someone's bait bucket. Spiny water flea and fish hook come on someone's boat for the most part. So last thing I wanna leave you with is you know, you, why you should care about plankton. This is tiny stuff that lives in water. Um, and this is from one of my other grad students who worked with me several years ago. Um, her name was Erin Hayes Pontius. And she had this great slide that I, I've used for a long time uh, since then. This is actually Flathead Lake in Montana. And it's showing the food web with plankton and fish and even bears and bald eagles. It's a very cool system, a great place to go and visit. And so Flathead Lake, is an important ecosystem, as I mentioned. Um, it's got a salmon fishery, it's got plankton. Um, it's very similar to Lake Champlain. But the thing that entered Flathead Lake that became a problem was our mice. Our mice is not native to that system. And lo and behold, guess what happened in Flathead Lake? Somehow the mice got introduced. And so it's this planktonic predator right in the middle of the food web. And the mice had had impacts on the rest of the plankton, not unlike the things I just showed you about Lake Champlain and spiny water flea and fish hook. Um, and that impact translated up to the fishery and caused the fishery of Flathead Lake to have some serious problems, the salmon fishery. Which impacted bears, which impacted bald eagles eventually. So what I would like you to leave this talk with, if you leave with nothing else, you don't remember anything about plankton or anything else, what you should remember is, if you don't care about plankton, you don't care about America. Thank you. Great, thanks Tim so much. We do have some questions in the yep. chat. Open my chat. Oh, there's one. I'll, I can tackle the first one quickly. <laughs> Would it make sense to introduce predators of the invasive species into Lake Champlain? So what do you think my response would be to that, given all this research I've done on the impact of other invasive species in the system? It's common. People say, oh, let's introduce the predator from Europe that feeds on spiny water flea, which would be a, another fish, probably a different species of salmonid. Um, how does that work with a conservation biology framework for the lake? Should we be introducing another non-native species to the lake? Do you think the communities in Vermont and New York uh, would, would be open to that or would accept that? Some of them would and some of them wouldn't. It would depend on what your conservation biology um, ethic was. My short answer to that is I would not introduce a new predator that's going to supposedly eat the, the fishhook water flea. The main reason is they won't eat them all, they'll just co-establish with them. And now you're gonna have another non-native species in the system, which will now compete with our native Atlantic salmon and our native lake trout. Um, you've created yourself a conservation genetics problem and a conservation biology problem by bringing another invasive in to control an invasive that you've already got. And I use that not just for Lake Champlain. I feel the same way about introducing beetles to control purple loosestrife. I feel the same way about um, lots of different aspects where we might go in and try to fix things because we're humans and we think we can fix things. Um, my, my career has told me that's not a good idea. Um, when I, I told you I did a postdoc in Louisiana and one of the things I studied was water hyacinth, which was an invasive plant that was at the World's Fair in 1922 in New Orleans and everyone got a bowl and they took it home. And then they put the hyacinth in the swamp and now it's become a huge nuisance. And in the 1970s, we tried to solve that problem 
by introducing the water hyacinth weevil to South Louisiana and we dropped them out of airplanes to try to be that invasive predator that would come in and eat the water hyacinth. What we now have is water hyacinth weevils, which are not native, eating the water hyacinth plant, which is not native, all over the swamps of Louisiana and all the native species are, are, are the ones that are, that are being impacted by that. So you, you, you got me with that question. My answer was a little long, but the answer to me would be definitely no. Um, the next one's a little more nuanced. Um, once they are here, what can be done about the invasive plankton without hurting the beneficial plankton? Now that's a really good question. And that's why I talk about preventing the invasions in the first place. Once uh, some of these species come, all four of those, um, there isn't much you can do to control. There's nothing about their biology. Um, now it is possible that we may find some treatment, uh, find some possibly a genetic treatment or some other, we can find a microbe, maybe a pathogen that, that will target these species, but we haven't yet. They're working really heavy on that for the zebra mussel, trying to find something uh, that maybe a virus that would take out the zebra mussel or, um, but we don't have enough research to, to have anything that would control any of those four species. Um, so unfortunately, we have to just sort of ride it out, take, you know, if we can do some mitigation measures, often with plants you can, um, some of you are familiar with the you know, water chestnut in Lake Champlain and how we pull that out, we have aggressive programs to remove that and reduce that in the lake. And that does have an effect on keeping that species in check to some extent. Um, so there are some things you can do for some species, but for these particular planktonic ones and aquatic fish, and um, no, there isn't much we can do once they get here. So our efforts are best spent preventing the invasion in, in the first place. Um, any others? Oh, that's a good one too. The one that just came up, Al do algal blooms affect the plankton populations in some way? And that works in both directions, right? Um, the answer is yes. Um, nutrients have a huge role in, in driving algal blooms, but planktonic predators on algae also do play a role. And so if we shift all of that plankton around to different species, um, we may be favoring species, for instance, that feed on other algae and not blue-green algae. And that may be part of why we see blue-green algae blooms in our ecosystem that have increased in the last two decades. Um, but there's, there's a relationship between algal blooms and plankton who feed on them. Um, yeah, so there's definite possibility that it works both directions. Plankton can affect algae blooms and algae blooms can affect uh, plankton as a possible food source. Um, some algae blooms are better food sources for certain species of plankton than others. And so we would see changes in the populations if we saw those shifts in the algal community. Good question. Other questions? Quiet group today. <laughs> <laughs> There's one. Oh, interesting one too. Uh, are you currently predicting any other future invasive species that we won't, don't wanna see? Um, not anything as bad as the two that just came, the fish hook and spiny water flea. And so you're talking to the plankton biologist for Lake Champlain. So those two for me were a big deal. And I would talk for years in my talks and my talk with, hey, we don't want these two invaders in our lake. Um, there are other species in other aspects of the lake that are a definite threat. Um, the current one that's the most, uh, talked about these days, this year and probably next year, is the, is the goby. Um, the goby is again a fish from Europe that came over in shipping and it's in the Great Lakes, it's in the St. Lawrence River, but it's now in the Hudson River and it's now in the Champlain Canal, which is water that feeds Lake Champlain directly in the South Lake. Um, the Champlain Canal connects the Hudson River and Lake Champlain uh, by a canal system. And so we're very worried that the goby will get through the canal, which is probably how the, the spiny water flea made it to the lake, most likely through the canal. Um, and the goby will then start in the South Lake and have an impact on Lake Champlain. Um, so that would be one of the main ones. In terms of plankton, unfortunately, the two major planktonic invaders, fishhook and spiny water flea, we've already got. 
one more question there. Oops. Oh, are we working on innovations or ways to remove the invaders besides introducing predators? Um, we often do that. I mentioned the uh, water chestnut, the plant, where we're working on ways to reduce them. Um, you know, there is a response that happens. There's an invasive species task force, which I've been on for, for several years. Um, when, when anything invades, that task force will mobilize and we'll have a meeting and we'll, we'll have, we have prepared in some way for these species. We know a lot about their biology. And so when Spiny Water Flea invaded, we did have a meeting with the task force said, is there anything we can do? And unfortunately, in the case of that species, they're small, they're microscopic. Um, there's nothing we can do to remove them. Uh, the conclusion of the task force was, we, we just have to monitor it. We just have to see what they do when they invade. There's no, we, we don't have any control techniques available to us uh, for, for many, of the, many of those species. Um, there's a good one about boats. What do we do about boats and having them being cleaned? Um, after getting into a new body of water so we don't bring in unwanted species. And that is a really good question. Um, I am sort of become an advocate that for not only the education that we see, we have boat ramp stewards and we have washing stations, those are all good. But generally speaking, those are also voluntary. Um, I believe that the solution to this, and, and I'm not really this kind of person, so it's kind of surprising to, that I'm gonna say what I'm about to say. I think we need a law. I think we need an invasive species transport law. And I, what I mean is a law with some teeth to it. Um, has anybody ever been to Alaska? You get off the plane in Anchorage, Alaska, and you go on the highway, one of the first thing you see is a $10,000 littering fee sign. One of the next things you'll see is a trooper beside the road with a McDonald's bag out the side of the road and him writing a ticket to someone from a car who threw that McDonald's bag out in the road. The ticket is for $10,000. That's what I mean by a law. A $10,000 fine for illegally transporting a species on a boat to another lake. And you don't even need to enforce it. All you need to do is publicize it and people will be like, I don't want to get charged $10,000 for moving this. I'm going to clean my boat. Most people will do things that are the right thing, right? But most people will do things if there's an incentive like that, they'll do it a lot quicker. So, so my idea is a $10,000 law for transporting invasive species to or from Lake Champlain. Now, I don't know if they'll ever enact that, but that's my idea. <laughs> I agree with the law. That was a good comment. <laughs> um, oh, how do you get involved with the task force? So it's set up by the Lake Champlain Basin Program. Uh, it's made up of professionals in the region, but I would contact the Lake Champlain Basin Program, which is, by the way, a great website to go to to look just at any Lake Champlain issue. Uh, they have a lot of stuff on these invasive species there. They have a lot of other really good material on the Lake Champlain Basin Program. Uh, website. Um, oh, another good one. Do you know of any native species ever gone extinct from an invasive? I'm not aware of that. Um, generally speaking, they go to really low abundances. So for instance, the rotifers in Lake Champlain, they literally plummeted um, to where our net sampling that we were doing was not detecting around 10, 11, or 12 of the species for well over 15 years. Now that doesn't mean they were extinct from the lake. It means they were just in such low abundances or they were hanging out in some refugia, which was probably the deep lake um, that we weren't detecting them with our net sampling. We then began in around 2002, three, four to detect these species again in our sampling. Uh, so I would say that was maybe a, a, a partial extinction uh, of some of those species as a result of zebra mussel impacts on the lake. But I, I'm not aware, but it could happen for sure of a native species that is be, becomes locally extinct, uh, particularly in the case of like a direct competitor or a direct predator. Um, if the invader comes in and just is such a direct interactor with that species, you could drive it to local extinction. Um, that's certainly a possibility. <laughs> 
But Tim, we've heard a lot of sort of doom and gloom. Do you have any sort of positive reports for us? Anything that's going well in the lake? <laughs> yeah, and I mentioned it a little in the talk, but water quality in the lake is actually, um, like I said, it's relatively stable for the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, we hear a lot in the press about phosphorus in the lake, but we actually still have an oligotrophic lake system with relatively clean water. What we really should do is keep it that way or try to reduce nutrients even further. Um, but yeah, there are some real positive uh, outlooks for Lake Champlain. Even on the invasive species side, we're in much better shape than the Great Lakes. We have, I think, I think with fishhook water flea, we got our 50th invasive species in the system. Well, Lake Ontario has like 187. So because we're not as connected to the other lakes, we have to go down the Richelieu River and then back up the St. Lawrence to get to Lake Ontario. Um, Lake Champlain actually sits in somewhat of an isolated position for the movement of many invasive species. So I did share a lot of concern over some of the ones that have come in. Uh, but, you know, we are, in, in terms of total invasive species impacts, uh, we are in much better shape than Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, and many of the other Great Lakes. Well, thank you so much. I don't see any more um, questions coming through, but if anybody wants to stay on and just um, chat afterwards, feel free to do so. Otherwise, thank you so much, and I will see everybody next week. Thank <laughs> you.